controller that can point and jump. And when I, I have these three little boys, and the two older ones play the, the Wii, and they just jump up and down all the, through the, whatever game they're playing. They are jumping physically up and down. And so the couch potato image we have mm -hmm. of kind of gamers it just doesn't apply to that genre. It seems that the multiplayer networked games, where you are pulled into a world and you have real friends in that world, who are real people who are connected you know, via, via virtual connections to this shared space, and where you have a persistent character that's growing over time mm. and then developing new skills and all that kind of stuff, those are the games that are truly addictive and people get pulled into that world. Um, so instead of uh, censoring our kids in terms of violence, we should be thinking about that sort of thing and what sort of game I, they're playing in, in terms of addiction. Yeah, I think... I, I had a student, I just want to say, yeah. I had a student once who told me that and he was involved in those games, the yeah. Persona games, and he said there is absolutely no reason why he would want to be in the real world. It's so much more gratifying right. for him to be playing these games. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's interesting. There have, been, interesting. there have been some studies of the skills that people get in those games applied to the workforce when they actually go to work. And it turn, in, in, in the studies that have been done, and John Seeley Brown is amazing kind of technology visionary, uh, was involved in some of these. They found that the skills from those games transfer very well to the real world in the sense that the games practice teamwork and collaboration. They just happen, happen to practice that collaboration virtually. Uh -huh. But think about the modern office place. You know, you're often on a team with people scattered all around the world, and you're interacting with them virtually, and your face-to-face -face encounters are much, you know, uh, there are much fewer of them than there were even 20 years ago. And you're managing all these different objectives, and you're dealing with a complex interface of data on your screen, and you're trying to hit your objectives with a team of distributed people uh -huh. around. Well, that's not so different than what happens in something like World of Warcraft. So I think there, there are skills even there that you get out of it. The problem is just trying to figure out the balance, and you know, I, I don't, I, I don't want this book to be used as an excuse for the, for the kid who spends all weekend playing World <laughs> right, of Warcraft right. to say, Mom, you know, like I read this book and he says it's okay. It's not okay. You need to get outside, and you need to read books and you okay, need to do all okay. of that. Okay. You know? Well, I don't, I don't want to belabor the, <laughs> the, the gaming, and I guess I am because I think our audience would be right, very course, interested yeah, in this. Yeah. But I have one more point about yeah. games, and that is, this is a male preoccupation, and really, I mean. I think about, I have two kids, I have a son and a daughter, my son plays the games, yeah. my daughter could care less. Yeah. Yeah. And so it's an interesting, uh, there is a gender yes. uh, uh, emphasis here that goes unacknowledged, I think, and I wonder what you, th what you think about that. Have you given it some thought? Yeah, it's a great, it's a great question. It, uh, the joking answer is that if the games are making it smarter, and the boys are playing more games, then it might give the boys a chance to catch up. <laughs> That's really good. <laughs> but, yeah. but they need all the help they can get. That's um, good. You know, I think what, what, you know, what's interesting is The Sims was the best-selling game of all time because girls played it. Uh -huh. And so we, and, and actually the, the number one, the, the single largest demographic of online networked game players are middle-aged women who play online kind of cards, basically. Huh. They, don't, they aren't going out yeah, on yeah. Dragon Quest, but they're playing cards. So, so there are some ways in which the story complicates. And, and I think the gaming industry is aware that they basically, it's been games built by men for men or for boys. Um, and and if, they do, if they get things right with something like Sims, they can make a ton of money. There are you know, girls and women out there who are ready to play these games. They just need to kind of be designed slightly differently with a slightly different kind of model. Um, and there seems to be more, there, there, there are more girl gamers now than there were certainly you know, mm -hmm. 10 years ago. Um, but Part of the context of the book, and I'm sure we're going to get to this, is that um, there's games, but then there's all, everything that's happening on the internet, everything happening with social media, you know, Web 2.0, and of course, um, television. And in everything other than games, the, the women have proven to be early adopters, sometimes faster. The women have actually been faster to adopt the social media things um, than, than men in a lot okay, of cases. Okay, yeah. Well, I'll let that drop yeah, for yeah, now. Yeah. Let's move on to television, because right. I do think that's interesting. You really say some fascinating things with graphs. Right, yeah. I had to chart <laughs> about television yeah. and how, in fact, television is really far more uh, complicated now than it used to be. Our tendency is to think back and say the glory days of television, and now it's junk and that really isn't so, not only in terms of the content, but the, the form yeah. of television. Could you explain a little bit? Sure, and I think actually this is one of the places, and I, I don't know how much of a role I had in playing this, but I think that, this, that the 
the conventional wisdom has shifted a little bit since this book came out. Um, and I think the kind of the end of The Sopranos, The Wire, um, and then shows like Lost, um, which came out before the uh, came out after the book was written. Um, there is a, a newfound sense that television is doing some really interesting things, um, and people seem more aware of it now. Um, the, the, again, this is, a, this is a comparative argument. This is saying, compared to where things were 30 years ago, um, uh, or 40 years ago in the case of television, because it dates back a little bit longer than video games do, um, there is more complexity, and that we are willing to tolerate as an audience and follow and embrace uh, more challenging narrative thread, threads, more complicated plot lines with more characters, um, more experimental ways of telling stories. Um, and all of that is something that we now accept as an audience in ways that would have been hard to accept mm -hmm. 30 years ago. And so that's why I have these charts, because I wanted to be able to kind of capture, because people forget what, the people, you know, they have a kind of a nostalgic memory of like, mm -hmm. oh, I used to watch Three's Company, or mm -hmm. I used to watch Dallas. A man from Uncle. That's right. <laughs> um, but when you go back and watch your shows, sometimes when I do, when I talk about the book in, in public, I make people watch um, the first four minutes of an episode from Dallas from 1978, which was, you know, the hottest show on television, big hit. And it's unbelievable how slow and condescending it is. And I don't mean slow in the sense of, you know, the, the camera work moving faster and the cuts being faster. Literally slow in terms of how it feels as if the creators of the show are talking to a six-year-old. Like, it's, you get the feeling from the dialogue that they're going, these two people are brothers. Did everyone <laughs> get that? You know, it has that kind of feeling. And it's just boring, you know? Mm. And then, you know, you switch to any, pretty much any narrative drama or sitcom now, and the the assumptions about the audience's ability to follow everything and make connections and, and not ha need a lot of hand-holding has just dramatically changed. Um, Lost is really the best example of this, which again is not in the book, but um, I think is the great confirmation of this. Lost is, is um, in terms of network television, the most complicated show that's ever been on network television, um, both in terms of the sheer number of characters, but also in terms of the very complicated temporal structure of the uh, of the way each episode is plotted. It goes backwards in time, it sh now it's gone forwards in time. Mm. Um, it's something you would have seen in a, you know avant-garde play you know, 30 years ago. It's now part of kind of mainstream. They're not traditional flashbacks. It's much more complicated than that. And <clears throat> there's this layering to all the mysteries in Lost. So there's geographical mysteries about where the island is. There's um, ontological mysteries about are they even alive. There's a mathematical riddle that's, that's, that runs through the whole thing. So it's vastly more complicated than anything was on television when I was first mm. watching TV. And crucially, it is a huge international hit. Um, it's not, you know, an educational show. It's not on PBS. It's a show that literally turned the fortunes of ABC around on a dime. And so there's something in the culture that has changed that has enabled people to, you know, kind of follow and embrace a show that complex and not be scared off Well, of granted that your points, the points that you've made um, are true and that we are, uh, that these new media are in fact making us smarter. Do you think to adopt the C.P. Snow notion of two yeah, cultures, yeah. art and science, we have now two cultures, those who are media savvy and those who are, I guess you could say bookish. And right. they, that tends to be older and yeah. more traditionally educated and that those two groups are in some sense at odds. Yes, I think that's right. And, and in a way, I have, uh, I've been trying most of my kind of writerly life to kind of get those two groups Bridge to talk those. to each other, you know, <laughs> really. I mean, I feel that that's, uh -huh. that's been a lot of what I've tried to do, both in, this, in, the, in the science and culture sense, and then I've written a lot of, uh, of science books from, a, from somebody whose training is in culture, basically. Um, and then in this generational sense. Um, for this book, you know, one of the interesting challenges of writing it was that I wrote it really with two primary readers in mind. One w was, you know, the parent who was trying to make sense of this new crazy world that their kids were living in, and then the kids who would hopefully read this book and say, somebody finally gets it. Mm. Um, and so e even in that little you know, those two imagined readers, I was trying to kind of bridge the, those two worlds and get those folks to talk to each other, um, which is challenging, it's hard to do. Um, it has been cool to see, I have to say though, with the internet, um, the generational uh, gap has not turned out to be the case. You don't have a lot of, you know, kind of 55, 65 year olds playing games. Uh, the gaming generation is now, it's much older. The average gamer is in their 30s because mm -hmm. it's, you know, kind of the generation slightly younger than me that's grown up. 
Um, but you don't see a lot of adoption of it in, in the generation older than mine. But in terms of internet use, in terms of even social media use, in terms of adopting all these new te technologies, recognizing the value that the internet offers, in fact, the older generation in some ways has been faster um, to adopt it in, because it gives them great connectivity to all their friends around the world and their family. I mean, it's a big thing for, you know, grandparents love <laughs> the internet for all that. So there isn't that division So there, there. hasn't been as much yeah. as I think we would have predicted. I mean, I have, this, use. I have this 96-year-old grandmother who is, you know, knows how to shop on Amazon and download photos and keep up with her grandkids um, and her great-grandkids because it's the best mechanism for that. And she, she overcame her resistance to this mm -hmm. new technology because the, the results were so, the rewards were so powerful. Well, let's shift gears a little bit. We're running out of time, and I am interested in this book of yours that came out a few years ago, The Ghost Map, The Story of London's Most Terrifying Epidemic, and How It Changed Science Cities and the Modern World. Yeah. Um, I assume you say that in this, in this book, it's about the cholera epidemic in Victorian London. Yep. And you say that it was one man, one doctor, who in fact solved the problem. So I assume this book is about the information, an information revolution of yeah. sorts. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you know, it's a logical leap from video games to 19th century cholera. That's the yeah. <laughs> you know, easy progression <laughs> to make. Um, yeah, it's a, it's a fun story uh, and a terrifying story in some ways. Um, it's 1854 in London, uh, the Broad Street outbreak uh, of cholera um, literally decimated the neighborhood of Soho in London. 10% of the neighborhood died in, in the space of about two weeks. Um, but it was at a point where the, the entire establishment thought that cholera was caused by poisonous air. Everybody thought this was the miasma theory. Everybody was convinced that this was the conventional wisdom of the day. Everybody was convinced that the smells of London were killing people because mm. London was insanely smelly at this point, right? It was just overrun with industry and, and they had no waste removal and it was just a terrible place to live. But the problem with cholera is actually that it's a, it's a contaminated water problem. And this outbreak happened because there was a pump at the center of Soho that had become contaminated with the bacteria that causes cholera. And everybody would go to this pump and they all got sick and they all died. Um, but this amazing man, John Snow, uh, who was a physician and a classic 19th century kind of polymath, had had this idea that cholera was actually in the water and not in the air, couldn't get anyone to, to buy his, his argument, published a number of things, everybody ignored him. But he lived in this neighborhood, and so when people started to get sick, it was so concentrated, he thought, you know what, this might be, there must be a single source for this outbreak because it's so concentrated. Mm -hmm. And so he went in, tracked it down, made a very famous map, the title of the ghost map comes from this map that shows all the deaths, basically the ghosts of, of Soho kind of arrayed around this pump. And eventually, you know, convinced the authorities that cholera was a problem of water, and the London sewers were basically built as a result of this. And cholera ended up having its last appearance in London in 1866. And wow. after that, it's been, it's been gone. It sounds like it could be a video game. It is, or, or some people say it's like a Victorian episode of CSI, is what <laughs> people say. Uh, <laughs> That's wonderful, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to thank you so much for being with us, Stephen Johnson. I look forward to reading that book and your forthcoming book which is entitled It's what? called The Invention of Air, and it's coming out right after Christmas. And it's set in Philadelphia? The parts of it are set in Philadelphia, yeah. It's my version of the kind of Founding Fathers books. Okay, well, I look forward to it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today at the Drexel Interview.